Hey everybody, it is You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week my first question comes from Patrick Dodds, who says, Steve, as an atheist, what do you think of comedian Bill Hicks's assertion that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively? There is no such thing as death, life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. And Hicks was quasi-serious when he said it. Do you think that the concept of all of existence being an illusion, an idea that weaves in and out of many Eastern religions and philosophies, has even the remotest possibility of being true? Or do you think this is purely flying spaghetti monster territory? <laughs> well, I think you're getting into late night philosophy territory, actually, with that. It sounds like the sort of thing that if you were up late drinking with your buddies and everybody's kind of tired and about to go to bed, that's the sort of question that somebody would sort of throw to the room, you know. What if reality is just an illusion, man? Like that sort of thing. The, the problem I have with accepting that something like that is true is, to me, as far as I can figure, it's an unfalsifiable proposition. Unless you are asserting that reality is obviously an illusion. And if that's your assertion, then I would like to hear some evidence. I would like to know what makes you think that reality is an illusion. But if you're just sort of throwing it up there, like, as, as a what if, there's no way you can ever prove that, and there's no way you can ever disprove it. It's an unfalsifiable assertion. And since that is the nature of it, I don't see any way to get there other than making just an unwarranted leap. So you, you or Bill Hicks or anybody could say, you know, all of reality is an illusion and we're just a shared consciousness imagining itself or experiencing itself in some sort of a dream state like that. That's all very well and good. For, for some people, that might be like an appealing notion. But for me to believe that that were actually true, I would need to know how you get there. I would need to know how you figure that out. Uh, and since I can't think of a way to get there, I can't reason my way there, I, I just accept it as just one of those sort of philosophical suppositions that isn't, that is fun to talk about and it's fun to sort of explore the implications of it, but it's not to be taken seriously. I, I, I don't think there's any reason to seriously entertain that notion. Haley Harris. Hi, Steve. I'm a film student, and since you like to make lists of five things, I was wondering if you could give us your five favorite movies of all time. What a wonderful question. You're not only a film student, but you, are you know exactly what kind of questions I love to ask, these bullshit masturbatory opinion questions. <laughs> um, my five favorite movies, it kind of changes from time to time, but my, my five at the moment... Uh, it goes, uh, number one is Sherlock Jr. That's kind of stable. That's been my favorite movie for a long time, which is a Buster Keaton movie, just a wonderful, magical, sort of surrealist fantasy film. Uh, number two would be 2001 A Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick. Again, that's, that's relatively stable. Number three uh, right now is probably City Lights, Charlie Chaplin's hilarious and tragic, beautiful, silent movie. Uh, number four... Uh, Ikiru, which is directed by Akira Kurosawa. Again, just a, oh, such a sad, sad movie. And so visually beautiful. Um, and then number five would be All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, directed by Lewis Milestone, starring uh, Lou Ayers, uh, which is simultaneously a great war movie and a great anti-war movie. And again, just wonderfully acted, wonderfully shot, just a, a, a tremendous achievement. Uh, in the movie. So th those would be my top five at the moment. Uh, but there are lots of other ones that I could talk about too. But right, right now, as I think about it, those are my top five favorite films. Ahmed Rokamish Youssef. Hey Steve, my wife and I are atheist ex-Muslims. I'm 42 years old and my wife is 30. And when I was 24 in 1997, I married her and she was 12 at the time. I grew up in the Middle East, not America, and my parents arranged a marriage for me, and she was chosen. At the time, I didn't really see anything wrong with it. I was raised thinking it was okay and part of Allah's plan. Anyway, we did marry, and yes, we had relations, and I hate myself for it. Anyways, we moved to America around 2003, and then I became an atheist in 2013, and then my wife became an atheist in 2014. I want to help people in our shoes. 
What can we do as a Muslim who experienced child marriage to help those in the situation? Also, any advice on how to learn to forgive myself for taking advantage of a child and to not feel like a sick monster piece of shit who deserves to go to prison? And also how to move forward as an atheist couple with a pedophilic past. I guess I do say nothing is too serious and nothing is too silly at the end of these videos, don't I? Um, well, I am not an expert on this subject. I don't have any real training or, or formal expertise to be making these kinds of judgments, but just on my very basic layman's understanding of the concept, it doesn't sound like you would qualify as a pedophile in the clinical sense. It sounds like you and your wife entered into this relationship thinking that it was normal. Within, within the culture that you lived, it was considered normal. And you weren't uh, having relations, as you say, with a 12-year-old because you felt a, a, a sexual desire to do so. Uh, you were doing it because you had been conditioned by the culture that you lived in to think that there was nothing wrong with this, that this was completely normal. So I don't know if it's entirely fair to you to describe yourself as a pedophile. Uh, now, you now have guilt about that. You now feel that, that an adult having sex with a 12-year-old is wrong. I would agree with you about that. That would also be my uh, take on it. That is also my sensibility. I, I, I do think that such an act is taking advantage of a child. I do think that it's something that should be completely uh, uh, frowned upon and not tolerated at all. So uh, I'm glad that we see eye to eye on that now, but I don't think that you can call yourself a sick monster for doing it back then because it seems like it was a situation where you just you didn't know any different you didn't know any better you don't know you didn't know then what you know now you didn't have the opinions then that you have now and i mean i i think it it's it's to your credit that you feel bad about it now but i don't think you can really do much good by beating yourself up over it um, I don't know if that would help you with your guilt or with your feelings of remorse over that or not. Um, but that's just how I see it. I'd, I would see no reason to condemn you based on what you told me in that question uh, for your relationship with your wife when she was 12. And as for what you can do for people who are in your situation, I think you should do what you did to me. You should share your story and not be ashamed of it and be open about it. Since you have had this experience and have had the change of heart that you have had and have the feelings that you have about it, you certainly must not be the only person to have these feelings. You and your wife must be sharing in an experience that, that many other people have shared in as well. And to me, I think the best way to help people who maybe are struggling with the same situation is just to share with them your experience, to share with them your story and your feelings and just let them know that it's that, that they're not alone they're not the only ones to have had these experiences they're not the only ones to have felt the way they feel and just reach out to people and tell them your story i think that's an incredibly powerful first step in relating to people and in helping people cope with a traumatic experience or or with a feeling of guilt over something they did in the past is to just let them know you're not a monster you're not a freak. You're not the only person who has gone through this. I've gone through it too. I came out on the other side. I'm okay. So you can be okay too. I mean, again, just as I am not an expert on pedophilia, I'm certainly not a therapist. Uh, I'm certainly not a psychiatrist or anything like that. Uh, but that's just, just my feeling. Uh, sharing your story with people can be tremendously powerful and tremendously helpful to people who find themselves in that same situation. Antonio Belavon Fernandez Ponce de la Torres. Dear Mr. Shives, I'm in 12th grade high school. I need some advice. My friend is a Mexican exchange student. He lied and said he's from Spain because last year when he went to another high school, he told everyone he was Mexican and the response was bad. He was seen as the poor, greasy gardener with the sombrero, donkey, funny accent who eats tacos. He was an outcast and seen as different. When he came to my high school and said he was from Spain, the response was positive. He was seen as a superior European with a sexy, exotic accent. Girls are into him and the guys think he's cool. 
I'm actually from Spain, so I found out he was lying, but I promised not to expose him. He's happier, but I feel like it's wrong at the same time. What should I do, and what should he do about it now in high school and in the future? Do you necessarily blame him? Thanks, Mr. Shives. You don't have to call me Mr. I appreciate that, but you don't have to call me Mr. You can just call me Steve. Um, well, as far as him being in that high school, I think you're doing the right thing by not exposing him. I don't think it would really accomplish very much to out him as a liar and a, a, a secret Mexican. Uh, because I, I completely sympathize with his reasons, especially if he had the experience of being mistreated in another school for being from Mexico. If I were in your situation, I would not want to expose him. Um, I would not want to, to uh, leave him vulnerable to that kind of mistreatment that he experienced before. I mean, it's not his fault. It's not his fault that people are assholes and people are prejudiced and people treat Mexicans in a, in a shabby way because of these stereotypes or these assumptions they might have about him or whatever. It's not his fault. And, uh, I mean, in an ideal world, he wouldn't feel compelled to lie about who he is in order to get by and to avoid being bullied and picked on and mistreated, but we don't live in that world. We live in this world where people often treat each other badly for really stupid reasons. Now, once he gets out of high school, uh, I, it, it becomes a little less uh, tolerable. It becomes a little less acceptable. I mean, I do think at some point he has to, he, sh he should be open about who he is. He should be open about the fact that he is from Mexico and not from Spain. I think for, if for no other reason than because it, would, it, it could make life very complicated for him if he misrepresents himself to the wrong person and it's found out that he is actually from Mexico as opposed to Spain and it makes, it throws doubt on his credibility as a person uh, it could make it difficult for him to find a job or to have trust with people. It, it would just make life a lot more complicated for him. So he should come clean and be honest with people at some point. But right now, while he's just trying to get through high school, uh, no, there's no reason to out him at this point. And it's really, I mean, even though you know and you, and you know the truth, it's really not your job. It's really not your responsibility. It's nothing that you should have to worry about as far as I see it. Just let him get through high school and then let him worry about it from that point forward. Brad Baumander. Hi, Steve. At the risk of ending our imaginary friendship I have in my head, why is Batman so popular? Don't get me wrong, I like Batman, but he's not my favorite. Everyone seems to think he is this underdog anti-hero, but I don't see that. He always pulls off godlike feats and often does the right thing more than Superman. What is it I'm missing, Steve? Why is Batman arguably the most popular superhero? Well, there are so many different facets to Batman that he can appeal to, to different people for entirely different reasons. I mean, you can like Batman for the toys and the technology that he has. You can like Batman for the car or the bat plane. You can like Batman as sort of a wish fulfillment fantasy. He's the guy who gets to go out and do things that the police are unable or unwilling to do. He can sort of play to revenge fantasies or, or power fantasies that readers have. Um, he has a lot of psychological complexity that he has picked up over the years thanks to some very talented writers who have worked on him. Um, he has a lot of tragedy in him. There's a lot of film noir influence, a lot of mystery influence. There's just, there's just a whole lot of stuff sort of in Batman uh, that is there for artists to draw on, for writers to draw on. You can be a writer and you can write Batman virtually any way you want and it will feel in character because the character has been so diverse over the years and has been done so many different ways. It feels like you almost can't do it wrong because it's been done so many ways over the years. So it's a very versatile character, and it appeals to very different things to different people. I can nail Jesus in the sexual way. Hey Steve, I have criticism about the atheist community, and I'm an atheist. I feel the atheist community are doing a bad job. I see negative, harsh attitudes toward people who are agnostic, atheist, deist, etc., these people who don't accept the religion but don't identify as an atheist, but at the same time fight all the same battles we do. To me, they are my allies, but for a lot of atheists, it's not good enough. They have this, you already know it's BS, just turn to the atheist side that's condescending. 
They have an obsession to debate. They made me feel like shit when I was agnostic. I'm afraid to use atheist label with pride, and why do a lot of them feel the need to make everything a fallacy? A straw man, a no true Scotsman about everything, even little things. It's like they are obsessed with these words. You're smart, we get it. Like seriously, get over yourselves. Don't even get me started on the passive-aggressive attitudes. Why can't most atheists be like you, Steve? You are actually someone I would not mind showing to a Christian. Someone who has open arms to many different groups of people with love and compassion. I wish you were the face of atheists, and I really mean that. Any advice or thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you very much for saying that. That's a very very kind of you to, to say those things about me. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know how much of it I deserve, but I, I'm, I, it makes me happy that you said it. Um, I agree with you. I, I think that, that there are people within the atheist community who have these kind of shitty, condescending, disrespectful attitudes, not just about allies on the non-religious side, like you mentioned, like, like agnostics or atheists or, or whatever people choose to identify as, um, but also people that could potentially be allies to many of the causes that are important to atheist activists from the religious side. It really makes me shake my head when prominent atheists will t go after moderate religious people. Because to me, religious moderates are some of the most powerful potential allies to atheists, to non-religious folks that there could possibly be. We should be friends. We should be on the same side. I should not, as an atheist, be trying to antagonize and alienate those people. I should be befriending them and allying myself with them. And I think we, in general, as an atheist activist movement, should be doing the same thing. So it drives me nuts that there are people in the atheist movement who are, are exactly like you described, who are obsessed with being right, who are obsessed with arguing and debating with people, who feel like it's, it's our way or the highway, you're either with us or against us, you're either an atheist or whatever you are is completely illegitimate and not to be respected. Uh, I'm with you 100% on the whole thing. I, I think it's, it's obnoxious and in terms of activism and, and our political goals, uh, it's totally counterproductive. Unicorn slaughter, or perhaps unicorn's laughter. I don't know. Hey Steve, long time watcher, first time poster. Love your videos. I wondered what your thoughts were on Indiana's and other states' Religious Freedom Restoration Act that has made the news in recent weeks. Full disclosure, I am a liberal, atheist, feminist, support LGBT rights, etc., etc., so this isn't a troll question. The libertarian in me feels this goes against one's personal freedom. If a religious cake maker doesn't want to bake a cake for a gay couple's wedding, should they not have the right to say no? It just seems wrong to force a private company to serve someone they don't want to. You used an example in your on uh, your longer unedited question that you posted of you know, what if what if uh, a member of the Westboro Baptists came in and wanted a God hates fags cake could the baker not refuse to make that cake well I think the baker could refuse to make that cake because he's not refusing because the Westboro Baptists belong to a particular church he's refusing because he finds the message offensive uh, and in many states that have hate speech laws, that would be considered hate speech. And you are perfectly within your rights to refuse to offer a service that would require you to engage in hate speech. Uh, so it's, it's not, it, uh, some people might think that, well, it's either way you're refusing service. What's the difference whether you refuse service based on hate speech or whether you refuse service based on the fact that you don't like gay people. It's kind of a slippery slope. That's, that is the situation. That legally is the way things are. You, sh you, you cannot, under most circumstances, and, and in my opinion, you should not be able to refuse service to someone based on their race, their sex, their sexual orientation, their gender identity, uh, their religion, their ethnic background, any of these what are typically legally protected classes uh, against discrimination. You sh I, I completely am on board for that. I feel like the good of society, the public good, the interest of creating a community and a country where people are free from discrimination overrides, in that case, the individual's right to be able to decide who he serves in his or her business. I, I, I think that's completely right, completely just, and I support it 100%. And I think the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, 
is a gross misunderstanding and misapplication of the concept of freedom of religion. To me, freedom of religion means that no one can force you to either stop practicing your religion or to start practicing another religion. Uh, it's, it's freedom to live out your beliefs as you see fit. As long as you living out your beliefs does not impose on the rights of someone else. Religious freedom doesn't mean that you can force other people to abide by your religious beliefs. And it doesn't mean that you can use your religious beliefs as an excuse for mistreating people. And we decided about 50 or 60 years ago in this country that legally speaking, refusing to serve someone or discriminating against someone in hiring or in any other sort of practice uh, because of their race or their gender or their ethnicity or their religion or, and this is a more recent addition, but it's, it's becoming more accepted because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, that that is a form of mistreatment. And you should not be able to use your religious affiliation, your religious convictions, your sincerely held religious beliefs, as the law says, as an excuse for discriminating against people uh, in those categories or because of those categories. Uh, I think it's just, it's a perversion of the idea of religious liberty, and I think it's disgusting, and I think all of those laws should be repealed. I think it's an embarrassment that we have them. And it's also kind of embarrassing that I haven't thought of a segue for this, so let's just go ahead and do it. It's time for... The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions, glib and adequate answers. Dear Wonder Bar Bar, isn't it odd that so many Americans think that God has always been a part of the Pledge of Allegiance when it has only been so for a little over 60 years? Are Americans really that obtuse when it comes to their own history? Yes. Troubleshooter125, Steve, is there a movie you haven't seen in a theater that you like slash want to? Also, have you ever seen a 70mm or IMAX print of a movie? And if so, which one was it? And what were your impressions, both of the movie and the format? I, You know what? I've never seen 2001 A Space Odyssey on the big screen, so that would probably be the top of my list. I would love to see 2001 on the big screen. Uh, no, I've, I've never seen an IMAX movie. I've never been to an IMAX theater, so I can't say what movie I saw and what I thought about it because I've never seen one. Sarah Santos. Hey, Steve, I have a quick question for the lightning round. Have you ever watched The Atheist Experience? If so, what is your opinion of it? Oh, yeah, I've seen The Atheist Experience. I've watched a bunch of episodes. I, I really like it. I, I love Matt Dillahunty. He's one of my favorite people in the community. Uh, I don't watch it regularly. I don't watch it every week, but I've seen it enough to know that I like it. And, uh, you know, it's it's a great... It's it's great for, like, if you're, if you're a new atheist and you want to see... Uh, atheists sort of arguing and defending their position against religious people. Uh, it's it's a really good place to start, I think. Uh, Radical Bacon, what's with the idea that if a guy sits when he pees, he's somehow less of a man? Well, I think it's just sexism. Girls pee sitting down. Men don't pee sitting down. That's not what a man does. You know, I think that's that's probably what it is. It's just it's just an example of sexism. Uh, Mick J One puppets over music every time. Okay, so you're given the choice between Rent or Puppetry of the Penis, and you choose Puppetry of the Penis. Rent? Seriously? Make it a little fucking easier next time. Jesus. Rent. For fuck's sake. Ugh. Mr. C's 83. Steve, if you could add an amendment to our Constitution, what would it say? I would add a very broad, uh, all-inclusive, equal rights amendment that would constitutionally... Uh, establish those protected classes that I mentioned in in the answer to a previous question to to officially at the constitutional level outlaw discrimination on the basis of sex and race and religion and sexual orientation and gender identity and all those other protected classes that I mentioned before I would do that that would be the amendment that I would add uh, common sense 1776 hey Steve what do you think a third party introduced into the American political system to break the deadlock of bipartisan politics to the political climate. I can't decide if it would hinder or help the current situation that the U.S. is in. What do you think? Uh, I think a third party would be a great idea. I also think a fourth and a fifth party would be a great idea. I would love to see a much more diverse group of, of political parties uh, become active and have influence in our, in our politics, because I think 
not only would it give more people a voice and would encourage more people to vote and participate in the system, but I also think that it would force the politicians that we elect to those various positions from those various parties to work together and form coalitions in order to be able to govern uh, instead of just existing in these two uh, blocks of Democrats and Republicans. Joseph Fapiano, hey Steve, lightning round question. What, in your opinion, is the most overrated TV show of all time? Or one of them, if you can't think of an all-time number one. I would say MASH. I have seen many episodes of MASH. I have tried and tried to give MASH a chance, and MASH has just never done it for me. I just don't get why MASH is such a great show. Reed Aspen, hey Steve, in some of your previous videos, you mentioned a quiz that could be performed to test the validity of the existence of historical figures. What was the title of it, or the name of the person who created it? Thanks. Also, based on the two statements, would you rather screw the pooch or eat a bag of dicks? Mixed bag, of course. Um, I think you're thinking of the Raglan scale. It's not really a quiz. It's more of a series of attributes that Lord Raglan, that's the guy's name who made it up, uh, put together uh, that, that are sort of uh, common themes throughout mytho-historical stories, like mythical heroes uh, often share these various characteristics. And the higher you score on the Raglan scale, generally speaking, the more likely it is that you are a mythical character rather than an actual historical figure. So I, you're thinking of the Raglan scale, I think. Um, and as for uh, would I rather screw the pooch or eat a bag of dicks, I would, I, ethically, I think I have to say I would rather eat a bag of dicks. Because eating a bag of dicks would make me an accessory to a crime assuming that the dicks were chopped off involuntarily uh, from their owners, uh, whereas screwing the pooch would make me actually, you know, I would be committing a crime. I would be screwing a pooch, committing an act of bestiality and animal rape. So I think it's better for me to eat the bag of dicks, morally speaking. Um, Sire A. No. Hey, Steve, I recently had a vasectomy, even though I have no children. Have you ever given thought to having a vasectomy? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to get one at some point. I haven't had one, but I, it's probably going to happen at some point. I don't know when or, at, you know, but yeah, I, I've given it some thought, and I'm definitely probably going to get one at some point. Yeah, it just it'll just make life a lot easier, you know, once everything heals. Hey, that's it for the questions. The vasectomy question was the last one. There was a bag of dicks, and then there was a vasectomy. It's like poetry. Anyway, before I get out of here, I'm going to do a shout-out, as always. And the shout-out this week goes to an awesome channel that, and I feel like I've said this a lot lately, but I can't believe I haven't shouted this channel out before. It's been on my list forever, and I just realized this week, oh, shit, I haven't given this guy a shout-out yet, and he so richly deserves it. It goes to Piro314. If you have not seen Piro 314's channel, you should totally check it out because he is great. He is a really insightful, thoughtful voice, a great commentator on religion and atheism and activism and the atheist community. He and I see eye to eye on a lot of issues with our our atheist community here on YouTube especially. I really value his opinion and his voice and his contributions to our community and to our discourse. Um, he uh, has a regular hangout that he does on his channel uh, called Illusions Exist that is really cool to watch. It's, it always runs about an hour. Uh, lots of videos and lots of other subjects. Uh, just a, a massive backlog of material and uh, the kind of channel that if you like it, you could just get lost in it. Like you could just watch, you could spend hours and hours and hours just watching old material of his. And he's still making new stuff as we speak. So uh, Puro314, that is the shout out. Fucking amazing channel. Check it out. Highly recommended for me. And if you like it, uh, subscribe and pay more attention to him because he definitely deserves it. Really great stuff. Well, that's it for me, everybody. I am done. I will be back next week. However, to do this all over again, provided, of course, that you ask me some questions. Because for this to happen, you have to ask. So leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. And I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can next time. So until next time, take care, everybody.